He was in public service for a remarkable 36 years, five of them as Premier of Ontario during World War I. So how come we know so little about Sir William Hurst, the province's seventh Premier? Matthew Shoemaker would like to do something about that. He's a city councillor in Sault Ste. Marie, that's Hurst's hometown, and he joins us now for more. Matthew, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me. So let's get into this. 36 years in public life and so little known about this guy. How come? Well, I think he's been a victim of uh, time, and he's fallen through the cracks of time, but his remarkable achievements warrant uh, more knowledge about his time in office, and uh, that's what I've been trying to, uh, trying to uh, convey. You're a bit of a history nut for Hearst, aren't you? Absolutely. How come? How did that happen? Well, he's from uh, Sault Ste. Marie, as you mentioned. He actually, uh, it was his adoptive hometown. Uh, but he, uh, I've, I've always loved history, and I never knew much about Hearst. So when I came upon a reference to the fact that we had a Premier of Ontario, the first Premier from Northern Ontario, from Sault Ste. Marie, it piqued my interest. And the more I learned about him, the more I realized how spectacular of a career he really had. And the fact that he wasn't recognized was uh, unfortunate. This is really strange. To show you how much things have changed, he won a seat for the first time in 1908 in Sault Ste. Marie, as you point out, and every single seat in Northern Ontario in that election went conservative. That's right. I mean, boy, are times different. What did the Premier of the day, that was James Whitney, what did he think of Hearst? He thought Hearst was great. In fact, he had asked Hearst to run in 1905, and uh, he had offered him at that time the Ministry of Lands, Forests, and Mines, even before he ran. And it was a debate between Frank Cochran from... Uh, from Sudbury and uh, William Hurst from Sault Ste. Marie as to who would run in the provincial election. And uh, they settled on Frank Cochran. He became the Minister of Lands, Forests and Mines, but it showed the uh, prestige with which uh, uh, William Hurst was considered by James Whitney to offer him a cabinet post before he even uh, form became a member of the government. Hmm. Now, one of the big issues that came up and landed on his desk was the question of the Ontario-Manitoba border. What was his involvement in trying to figure out where that border ought to be? Well, there had been a long-standing dispute between Ontario and Manitoba as to where the border was, and Ontario wanted uh, it to go to the Churchill River, and Manitoba wanted it further uh, east. And uh, so uh, in negotiations with the federal government, uh, Hearst managed to find a uh, solution that resulted in Ontario's size expanding by 56%, its land mass expanded by 56%, the district of Kuwaitan, as it was then known, was added to Ontario. This, the uh, dispute was resolved between Ontario and Manitoba, and uh, I mean, we've got uh, that entire district up uh, by James Bay because of Hearst's uh, negotiations. So this province is as huge as it is, mostly because of Hearst. That's right. Let's put, this is even before he becomes Premier, we're going to put up this graphic here now, Sheldon, about some of the things that he was responsible for. For example, championing a bill limiting miners to working eight hours a day. That affected 4,000 miners in Ontario at the time. He introduced two bills on political contributions, making it illegal for corporations, liquor license holders, and public contractors to contribute, and he got past the Workers' Compensation Act. Now, having said that, one of the big controversies he had to deal with at the time was the bilingual schools question. What was that all about? Well, Regulation 17 had been enacted by Premier Whitney, and it restricted the amount of French that could be taught in public schools. And uh, it really uh, angered French Canadians, or Franco-Ontarians mm -hmm. spe specifically. And uh, he, the, the issue came to a boil during Hearst's uh, time as Premier. After Whitney died, Hearst took over as Premier, and the issue really came to a boil. There were disputes which led to the Ottawa School Board shutting down their schools for entire school years, uh, protests, teachers on strike, students walking out, nobody getting good service from the provincial government because of it, mm -hmm. and uh, really uh, hampered and, and, and negatively affected Hearst's um, uh, legacy because of uh, the dispute uh, between Franco-Ontarians Franco and the government of the day. You hinted at it in that last answer, but and you hate to call this a big political break, but the fact is, in the 1914 election, he was personally re-elected as an MPP. The Premier, Whitney, won the government, and then a few months later, died. Did Hearst actually want to succeed Whitney? Well, it was actually Whitney who recommended Hearst as his successor. So, uh, of course, Hearst was 50 years old. He had been in Cabinet for... Uh, approximately four or five years at that time. So he was well regarded within government, but it was her, uh, Whitney's uh, personal letter to the cabinet, which chose the replacement for Whitney as the party leader and therefore the premier, that uh, uh, catapulted Hearst, that you could say, into the premiership. 
This 1914, of course, World War I has begun, and while mostly it's a national responsibility, the provinces did have some role to play. What did Hearst do because it was wartime to change the way Ontario lived? Uh, it, uh, there are many quotes uh, from Hearst that say that the war allowed him to pass legislation which would have otherwise been uh, unthinkable in peacetime. Uh, this is uh, things like uh, recognizing women's right to vote, which was his largest achievement. The Ontario Temperance Act, which restricted uh, you know, the ability of, uh, of places to sell liquor. Um, he, he passed so much uh, groundbreaking legislation uh, during that time, he created the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. He passed a provincial highways program, created the Department of Transportation, created the Ministry of Labor for a conservative. That's a notable achievement. So it's uh, uh, all, it was a very active uh, term in government. As I read the history, though, he, had, he yes, he gave women the right to vote, but he was initially against it, wasn't he? He was not against it. He, uh, he recognized women's right to vote in 1917. Um, he had always thought that women would ultimately be granted the right to vote. Uh, but it was just a matter of, uh, as a conservative, he thought there was a time for everything and uh, that the time for enfranchising women uh, would come and that it wasn't yet that time. But the circumstances of the war changed all that and per uh, made his thinking uh, advance and more quickly than it otherwise might have. Now, we've just heard that the government of Ontario today is about to embark on a $12 billion plus retrofit of the Darlington nuclear plant. And that's going to be probably the most sizable construction site in North America when it happens. Back then, we're talking 100 years ago now, he greenlit the biggest construction project in the world, which was 100,000 men expanding our hydroelectric capabilities at Niagara Falls. He got into some trouble on this, though, right? What happened? Well, it was uh, the Chippewa project, as it was known, to generate electricity from Niagara Falls. And there was uh, Ontario Hydro, which was relatively new at the time, uh, wanted to reduce the uh, amount of coal they were bringing in because they were spending $100 million a year on coal. And $100 million 100 years ago? Yes. That's and a fortune. Absolutely. No. So he uh, greenlit the project, but the costs, as with uh, many uh, projects that uh, are of that scale, continued to increase and, um, and, and got out of hand. And, and he and the chairman of the Ontario Hydro Corporation at the time did not uh, necessarily get along so well, so uh, there were accusations that perhaps the costs got out of hand purposefully to embarrass the government. That chairman's name was Adam Beck. There's a statue to him 15 minutes from this studio on University Avenue. It's kind of funny, though. That it went four times over budget, which meant it cost $76 million. I mean, that's kind of quaint to think about that kind of money today. World War I comes to an end in 1918, and one of the most interesting developments in Ontario political history happens the rise of the United Farmers of Ontario. Why did this happen? There was a lot of discontent uh, from farmers during the wartime. The cost of living was continuing to increase, inflation was very high, uh, and yet the federal government fixed the price of wheat, and so farmers' wages weren't rising at the time so as to not profiteer from the war, although uh, the farmers made accusations that industries were profiteering from the war. And it resulted in uh, severe discontent amongst farmers and the United Farmers Organization, which was originally an advocacy group, changed into direct political action, formed a political party in essence, and decided to contest elections. And that happened in uh, late 2018. Uh, 1919. 1919, yes, sorry. 1919, yes. Uh, well, let's put the election results up, shall we? Here's October 20th, 1919. And the United Farmers of Ontario win 45 seats, first place. They win the government. The Liberals are in second at 29 seats. And there's Hearst's Conservatives in third place with 25 seats. And Hearst lost his own seat in Sault Ste. Marie. But if you flip to the next graphic, and let's see how the votes actually turned out. The Conservatives got the most votes in that election. Liberals second. And the United Farmers actually got the third most votes, but they won the most seats. Uh, first past the post is sometimes a very funny system, but there we go. Uh, what happened? How come all of a sudden everybody turned on Hearst? Well, there were 70 predominantly agricultural ridings in Ontario at the time, and uh, the United Farmers won a great deal of them. So it, uh, they only got 22% of the vote. Uh, the percentages weren't shown there, but they got 22%. The Conservatives got 35, and yet they won more seats than them. So there was just significant discontent. The vote, uh, the provincial vote, was held at the same time as an Ontario plebiscite on whether or not to 
keep the Ontario Temperance Act in effect, and it resulted in many people, many more people going to the polls than perhaps otherwise might have, and it was a uh, landslide. Well, that's what I wonder. I guess women voted for the first time in this election. Is there any indication that that demographic had a significant outcome on the election? Well, uh, I think the expectation from Hearst would have been that as he uh, recognized women's rights to vote, uh, they would support him. However, the wives of farmers who were very discontent with the uh, government uh, came out and were strong temperance supporters, as was Hearst, but since they were coming out to vote for the Temperance Act anyways, they voted for United Farmer uh, candidates and therefore uh, it's, it's suggested that uh, cost Hearst the election. Now, United Farmers, of course, went from basically nothing to government in one election. Did they expect to win? They did not. In fact, they didn't even have a leader. Ernst uh, Drury, who became premier, did not run for a seat in the 1919 election. And it was only uh, after the uh, election was held and the United Farmers realized that they were going to form government that they decided to pick a leader. Ernst Drury ended up being the, uh, the premier. But uh, Hearst, in fact, stayed in office for nearly a month and a half after the, his defeat so as to uh, smooth the transition, allow <laughs> them time to, uh, to form government. Was he shocked to lose his own seat? He was. Uh, he, even uh, uh, all the pundits at the time, the newspapers were saying that Hearst was going to walk to an easy re-election and uh, he suspected he would walk to an easy re-election and uh, sure enough, that wasn't the case. Didn't work out that way. What happened to him after he left Ontario politics? He sat on the International Joint Commission for many years and uh, he was appointed by uh, the then Prime Minister, um, Arthur Meehan or, or Robert Borden, I'm not sure who was Prime Minister in 1920, but uh, he had a long-standing dispute with Mackenzie King once Mackenzie King was re-elected as Prime Minister, or was first elected as Prime Minister and Mackenzie King wanted him off the International Joint Commission but he refused to uh, go and so he, uh, he he always had the position on the International Joint Commission until he decided to retire but it was not without some uh, struggle to keep his own job. So he and King were pretty bitter enemies. Absolutely. Where are they both buried? They're both buried at Mount Pleasant Cemetery. And, Ten uh, minutes from the studio. Absolutely. They are both buried not that far away from one another. No, probably uh, you know 100, uh, 100 meters 100 away meters, maybe. Other, yeah. Well, let, let's fess up here. You and I went there this morning. That's right. We went to the cemetery, because I, I didn't know that uh, Hearst was actually buried in Toronto, very close to here. And we took a look. H have you got these pictures, Sheldon? Let's bring these up. This is, uh, there's his final resting place, the headstone. And there you are beside it. And if we look at the next one, that's you. What are you doing there? I'm uh, placing a Sault Ste. Marie flag uh, on his, uh, near his tombstone. We, uh, uh, the City Council of Sault Ste. Marie recently redesigned the Sault Ste. Marie flag, and so I uh, thought it appropriate to bring uh, Premier Hearst one. And there is the plaque, which is a relatively new thing. The Ontario Heritage Trust puts plaques on the final resting places of all of Ontario's premiers. Uh, there have been 25 premiers in total, uh, still, I guess, about six of them alive, I think. And. Um, Hearst is only 10 minutes away from here. Why do you admire him so much? Uh, he was from the Sioux, and, and of course, it's, it's interesting to know that people from the Sioux have made an impression in the world. I mean, he was knighted in 1917 by King George. That's right. He is Sir William Hearst. Correct. That's right. And, uh, you know, he had such an impact on, on Ontario society with all the projects he approved in franchising women uh, or, or recognizing uh, women's right to vote. And to run. And to run, yes, absolutely, in 1919, uh, that was separate legislation, and created many ministries that still affect our, our daily life, and, and he was just not being recognized, and I think his, his contributions to Ontario, to Sault Ste. Marie as, as its member, as the first Premier from Northern Ontario, are such that they deserve recognition. Hmm. The first Monday in August in Ontario's capital city is called Simcoe Day. In my hometown of Hamilton, I think it's George Hamilton Day. In Burlington, I think it's Joseph Brandt Day. What do they call it in the Sioux? Sir William H. Hearst Day. There was a, uh, as uh, I was elected to City Council in 2014, 2015, I brought a resolution seeking a way to honor Hearst, and uh, Council agreed that we should honor him by renaming our civic holiday to Sir William H. Hearst Day. Hmm. There is a town in Northern Ontario called Hearst, Ontario. It's not that big, and it's hard to get there. Who's that named after? Named after Sir William Hearst. In fact, in 1911, when Hearst was ultimately appointed the Minister of Lands, Forests and Mines after his initial uh, election victory, the town of Grant, which was uh, at the time that town in northern Ontario, decided to rename itself in his honour and is now known as Hearst, Ontario. How about that? 
Well, we are happy you made the trip down here from Sault Ste. Marie, 75 years to the day after the death of Sir William Howard Hurst. And we're grateful you made the trip here to TVO to tell us all about our seventh premiere. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.